Our next speaker is a co-founder and principal consultant at InnoQ, that is a Germany and Switzerland-based consulting company. He started to work as a C++ and Unix programmer, got to know databases, network programming, became a team lead, project manager before finally deciding to, that he wants to become a freelance consultant and later on a co-founder. Therefore, we can say that Stefan is making an impact in IT industry since 1990s. So please welcome to the stage, Stefan Tilkov. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jana. I am a software architect. What's a software architect doing at an Agile conference? Um, to be quite honest, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not exactly sure how I ended up here. But I do want to talk about something that I think is at the, at the intersection of multiple disciplines in our industry. I typically do talks like this and, and talk about this particular topic at very um, technical conferences where I always have to emphasize the human side and the importance of things beyond technology. And it's going to be an interesting experiment for me to emphasize the different things, how uh, the architectural side and the technology side is important, even if the thing you care most about is humans and the way they work together. So given that background, I decided to start with a very, very brief introduction into my world for those of you who, who don't know it that well. So what do software architects care about? What is software architecture? Um, you, can find about a few, you can find a few hundred definitions of what software architecture means if you go to the SEI website, that's the Software Engineering Institute in the US, and you can pick your favorite one, and they all share some commonalities and have some differences, but the general gist is that it's sort of the, uh, the structure, the important structural parts and components of your program and the connections they have, the relations they have to each other, and the principles that govern how they are designed and how they evolve over time. That's a very nice, concise definition. You could rewrite it like this, right? It's the, it's the stuff that's important. Martin Fowler likes to say it's the stuff that's expensive to change your mind about. Right, so you make some decisions and you can easily decide to do things differently, it doesn't really matter. But some of the things are really define the structure of what it is that you're building and it's really, really hard if you find out that you made a big mistake with that to change it as an afterthought. That's to me is sort of what, what differentiates academic software development where it's really about an idea and showing that an idea works as to actual real production software development, where you have to care about the non-functional requirements, which is a really stupid term. I hate non-functional because nobody wants their software to not function. But it's still a non-functional requirement. That's the standard way of to, to talk about those things, because those are all the things that you sort of assume if you're a non-technical person. All the illities, right? Stability and testability and maintainability and scalability and all of those things that don't have anything to do with the actual function of your program, but rather are um, uh, quality attributes of the kind of thing that you build over there. Now, I've worked in a lot of agile projects, and I've talked to a lot of people who, uh, who really uh, focus on, on this particular part of the industry, um, and I know that most of you do, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And I've sometimes run into people who think there's a, there's a clash between the idea of architecture and the idea of agile development. And again, this is a horse that's been beaten to death a number of times. Still, I'm going to try once more, just very briefly, to maybe um, address any doubts any of you might have that these things do not work together. And I've got another quote here, one that I like a lot, and I'm going to read it to you in three parts. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked. That seems like a very obvious kind of thing to say, but like all obvious truths, there is a lot of depth to this particular thing. A complex system designed from scratch never works, and more importantly, it cannot be patched to make it work. You just can't turn, invent something very complex from scratch and expect it to work. You have to start over beginning with a working simple system. So if you look at this definition of system design, this is not from software architecture, but it's from a system design book, then you can notice that the idea of evolving things, of growing software, is a very important one if you're thinking of it from a, from a, tech, from a purely technical perspective, regardless of human dynamics of people and, and of, of, of processes or maybe 
um, delivering value to clients. All of those things that people value in, in modern software development projects, like always have working software, deliver incrementally, get fast feedback on whatever you did, uh, have efficient communication, have small teams, these are all nicely, they can all nicely be related to the attributes of the system you're actually building. And that thought is something that I'm going to address a number of times today. I'm tr I will try to show that we're all, we all want the same sort of things and that we cannot have one without looking at the other as well. All of this stuff is very much interconnected. Um, in fact, I think that no matter what kind of system you build, incremental delivery is a prerequisite. If you want to deliver something meaningful, useful, that's beyond trivial, you have to do it in an incremental fashion because that's the only way to learn that you're building the right thing. And so to me as a software architect, it's very important to say that architecture does not mean big design up front. An architect who thinks their value is in creating a, uh, to take a year to create a design that then somebody else will have to build, that's, that's a concept that has actually never worked, but people used to believe it could work, but that was like two decades ago. Nobody in their right mind believes it anymore. So architecture does not mean big design up front. Having said that, what is it that architects actually do or that they think they do? And again, you can see a different kind of conflict. I'm gonna, going to address that only very, very briefly. It's the kind of conflict between an architect's, software architect's self-assessment and the way they're, they're perceived by others, right? So if you look at a typical software architect, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of still, still self-identify as that, um, even though I talk about it most of the time these days, then a software architect wants to make important decisions, right? They want to be involved with important stuff. That's what architects do. If you look at your, uh, your peers who maybe have an architect role officially or unofficially, that's what they want to do. They want to be involved with strategy. They want to shape strategy. They want to explore new technologies and they want to mentor, mentor developers. They typically are senior developers or used to be senior developers and they, work, they want to work with others. So that's what an architect wants to do. It's the ideal scenario. Now, the problem is that very often architects are perceived as doing something completely different, right? They always pick the wrong tools. They always make the wrong decisions. They never listen to developers. They never listen to anybody because they're, they're so full of themselves and say sure, so sure that they're the only ones who know how things work, that architect has become an insult for some people, right? So some people think, I don't want to have an architect role on my business card because then everybody will know that I'm an idiot or that I'm pretentious, um, which is kind of really sad because there are, there are good things to this particular position or to this particular role or to the tasks that you do here. So what I've found architects actually do most of the time is they sort of become... Um, salespeople within a positive sense, right? Not like selling something that is stupid or bad, but actually having to justify themselves, to justify their, their decisions makes them better architects and gets them much more buy-in for the stuff that they do. So that was my, my very brief rant on that I think there's no conflict between different roles. Developers can be architects, architects can be developers, um, scrum masters, agile coaches, it's all, it's, it can all flow together and they all share the same goal, which is to build awesome stuff. Now something that I've seen in the last few years, and that's the actual topic of my talk beyond this rant, is that um, we see uh, major transformations on a larger scale being applied in many, many organizations. And that leads to, uh, to an observation that's, that's a few decades old, um, that, that's become popular recently in the last four or five years or so, and it's being replayed everywhere. So uh, that is the, the connection between architecture and organization. The structure of the software that we're looking at and the structure of the organization that we're looking at have a strong interconnection. And that's actually known as Conway's Law. So my guess is that most of you know about this. Who here knows Conway's Law? Have many people heard of that? It's, it's just a few. It's interesting. So Conway's Law, um, uh, posted or postulated by uh, a man called Melvin Conway, um, says that you can observe the communication structure of the organization that built a piece of software in that piece of software. So let's say you have three teams working on a complex piece of software, then the software itself will be composed of three components because that's the only way the three teams can organize their work, right? They, you, will, you will see it reflected. In fact, the, the little distinction here is important. You won't see the org chart reflected. You won't see the organization structure that the organization thinks it has reflected. You will see the actual communication structure reflected. So if two of those teams are co-located and can have lunch together, then their components are going to have much 
tighter interconnections. They're going to be much, much more tightly coupled than if they're in different time zones, zones across the world, even if they're nominally one team. Right? So you can see communication structure um, reflected in, in architecture everywhere. You can, you can draw little pictures to, to, uh, to visualize that idea, which is essentially that you can build a, software, a piece of software with a huge team and you will get one huge thing, or you can separate into smaller teams, a modern thought that will reoccur a number of times. Um, but what I also find very interesting is that you can use this law to your own advantage. So you can think of ways to exploit that connection. Once you're aware of it, you see it everywhere. And you can start doing interesting things. Like, for example, um, recognizing that if you pick a particular architectural approach, there are certain org models that you, can, that you can implement and others that you can't. For example, if the architecture contain, con, con, contains a very centralized part, then you will end up with having some team that's responsible for that centralized part, and it will have a centralized role in the organization. If you don't have it, there's going to be a problem. The same is, of course, true the other way around. You can also reverse it slightly differently and say, well, I pick this architectural approach because I want a certain kind of organization to emerge. Now, that is something that we do with a lot of startups we work with, right? We, we design, we, we're, we're software architects and software developers, so our main goal is to build actual systems. But if, you're, if it's a startup, then the system that's being built grows together with the organization that supports it. And if you think of how to scale an organization, then making key decisions about the software architecture of the system that you're building influences the kind of organization that emerges, like a decentralized organization with autonomous units, which is something that we'll, we'll address very shortly. So um, that's, that's sort of the intro part. This is going to be the theme of the whole thing. And the, the, the method or the, the way I'm going to present this is using patterns. Now, I'm, I don't have a real pattern language. I'm not, not into that a real academic uh, strict thing here. I'm just using it very loosely. In general, I have a pattern. There's a description and approach, some consequences. So just to give you an example of something that I might talk about at a technical conference, it could be something called microservices, which probably a lot of you have heard at least. So that's an idea where you have little independent modules that are run as separate services, and you can deploy them separately from each other, and you get additional degrees of freedom. So something that used to be an implementation detail in many architectures becomes a number one first, first class design principle. That's what you do. And the consequences, hopefully, are that you have more autonomy and more isolation. You can build those. I'm not gonna, not gonna do a, a sales pitch for microservices here. That's sort of a pattern, right? It's, an, it's, a, it's a pattern that shows um, a, a recurring thing that you can observe in many organizations and system structures. And if we have patterns, then we, of course, also have anti-patterns. An anti-pattern also has description, has some reasons why it happens, um, and it also has some consequences. So a good anti-pattern to look at is microservices, because you, this can turn out to be both a pattern and anti-pattern, right? So if you have microservices, is this architectural style, and do it wrong, then you get an arbitrary selection of little modules that make no sense at all. And you, the reasons you do that is because some of your developers or architects went to a conference and thought everything was awesome just because some person on the stage mentioned it, and so they applied it wrongly, and you end up with a, with a huge mess of things that gives you all of the downsides of traditional architectures plus all of the downsides of microservices. Again, I'm not going to turn this into a microservices talk. I just want to give you an impression of the kind of patterns that I'll be talking about. So what are some things that you, that you can observe we're not at a tech conference. If we were at a tech conference, I'd be talking about conference-driven architecture as my, number one, um, as my number one scenario here. I won't. In fact, I won't show you the detailed pattern descriptions most of the time because it's kind of boring if I read this stuff to you, right? That's, that's, I'm going to skip over those. I'm just going to show you a few, few little uh, pictures instead, and you can read up on the patterns afterwards if you want to. So let's talk about the first one that I think really highlights this, this connection that I want to emphasize here. This is one of those architectures where somebody has decided to uh, decompose the system into small microservices, right? This is, uh, this is the architectural pattern, the overall pattern that people use. Smaller things, it sounds reasonable. Now, in any re reasonable system, especially in a large system, we have a number of stakeholders, right? We have those people that want something from us that want the system to do something differently or do something new. And most of those stakeholders will have an effect on that system in some regard. Let's say the stakeholder affects these parts. Now, the problem is if this stakeholder affects these and the third stakeholder affects these parts, 
then you have, you have misjudged the usefulness of the whole approach because now all of the changes will still need to be synchronized. The whole idea of this micro, or one key idea of this microservices approach is to isolate stakeholders so that they don't clash with each other, so that you don't have to convince one to test the stuff for the other one. You don't have to synchronize release schedules. You have to convince somebody who has different priorities to agree to something this other stakeholder wants to do. If you do something like that, then again, you get all of the downsides, but none of the benefits. And it's because you have not taken into account, as an architect, the interplay between the system's architecture and the stakeholders involved in changing it. And that is, to me, the key mistake in many systems. Now, the way I phrased it here, this is a, this is a the domain, it's, it's a business, it's a logic problem, right? These are business requirements that we're talking about. Fascinatingly enough, architects are very good at doing that to themselves, right? So um, if you were an architect, I would make a game out of asking what you think this one means, and then I'd show you this and ask you maybe now, do you know it now? This typically is something that, uh, that a platform team of architects creates, is sort of the useful reusable core thing that everybody is supposed to use who builds something. And again, you end up with this platform person, but this person is now stakeholder for everything because a change to this particular piece of software now means that every service is affected and you have this super powerful, super centralized bottleneck person or team who is now responsible for a lot of things. This decoupling illusion is to me at the moment the most, uh, the, the, the most frequent thing that we see in, in misguided microservices architecture attempts. You can see similar things when you decompose stuff. This is a, another brief visualization that I did once where you have this, this monolithical systems. Many people in these days try to decompose monolithical huge systems into smaller things. So the development teams and the architects agree to do that and they cut it apart and turn it into a nice collection of small little things. But the problem now is that on the right side we have an ops department that sticks to its existing processes and requires this thing when it goes over here to become a single deployment artifact that is then put into production, which again means that you've invested all of this effort on the left with no benefit at all because you simply decided not to talk to the ops people up front. So half-hearted or half-assed modularization is one of those things that we see a lot as well. Let me, let me pick a few more. So this is one that I, uh, that I like to contrast with the next one. This is one that actually uh, is um, the negative chaos, um, uh, the ne ne negative chaos anti-pattern. So I like, I like some things about chaotic systems. I like the way that structure emerges. I like the absence of rules a lot um, because I think creativity and innovation is really fueled by people being allowed to do something. But there is useful and there is useless chaos, and I've tried to pick something that doesn't look like a place you would want to live in, right? So I don't know about you. Maybe some of you would like to live there. I don't know. I wouldn't. So I, I would argue that uncreative chaos and chaos that doesn't add this particular type of value is not a good thing. You don't want to have that. So we would count that as an anti-pattern. But the other extreme, which would be something like this, is clearly not a good alternative. Right? So we occasionally see this in companies that didn't, didn't do software in the past, who maybe were manufacturing businesses that were around for 200 years, and they have a structure that's very, very strictly hierarchical, where it's very clear that everybody has their exact responsibilities for a little part of the whole system, and dis important decisions are made higher up the chain. Right? So you can see somebody at the very top of the chain making an architectural decision, trying to standardize everything everywhere, and this will kill absolutely all creativity and it'll make very sure that no good people will want to work for you so that is not a good approach as well so again it's it's i'm i'm still ruining your day i know i'm talking about anti-patterns but i haven't shown anything positive yet so let me see whether i can change that with some of the patterns and as you can guess they're they're sort of related to the anti-patterns that i talked about so my favorite one and one that i see and that we discuss with a, with a lot of clients at the moment and within a lot, in a lot of projects and that we've actually, actually seen successfully applied very few times because it's really hard, is the idea of having what we call autonomous cells. Now, we use that term because it's not, it doesn't have any other connotations. The idea here is that you create small units that can actually do something meaningful on their own. And I've, I've put business and 
dev and ops people in there, but it really doesn't matter whether it's these three roles or any others that you might need to deliver some actual value. My favorite story here is from, from a friend of mine who used to work at, a, at an investment, or still works at an investment uh, trading company in, in the US. And they have a concept called a desk. And this desk is sort of a, it's a, it's a business domain uh, that, for example, they trade in with a particular commodity or they trade in currencies or they trade in a particular kind of whatever industrial good, I don't know. So these people are like eight people sit around a desk and it's like the head trader and two junior traders and two assistants and two software developers. And they try to make money. That's what they do. So one of the developers might say, well, uh, boss, I think I got a great idea for a new feature that we could introduce. And the, and the head trader says, that's a stupid idea. Let's not do that. And then she does it in, in sort of secret. And at the, on the, the next day says, well, I've tr simulated it. If we'd done that yesterday, we'd have an extra five million today. And so the head trader will say, OK, just go ahead and do it. This kind of interaction and this very direct interaction among participants who share a common goal is, I think, an absolute ideal and the, and the ideal thing that we should have. Now, this idea of cross-functional teams is, I don't know, 30 years old. It's not really new. What's interesting here is that it has consequences to the architectural side as well. You can't do that if those autonomous cells aren't autonomous. And their autonomy is limited in very many cases by the systems they're working with. Right, so the ideal scenario would be something like this, where the, the, uh, the, the carving out of smaller systems matches the cell structure that you have here, so that a particular team is responsible for its own system, or maybe more than one system, but you never have the case where a system is shared by three autonomous cells who have different business goals. This is sort of the absolute anti thesis to uh, integrated ERP systems, right? We have the exact opposite approach. And the reason for that is that we're here not optimizing for the last bit of efficiency. We don't want to save the, the, the maximum amount of money. The key point here is we want to be able to move fast. We want to be able, we want to, be able to be agile. We want to be able to introduce new things flexibly and quickly into the market. This is something that we, that we observe in startups, where we sort of, it's easier to set up the structure if it's not a company that already has a few hundred people working for it. We also see it in, in companies that sort of transform themselves to new structures, where they try to get as much decision power into this, into this particular unit. We also see people dropping the whole concept of projects. Right? They, they, they're building a service anyway, right? they're building a service this company's operating for the foreseeable future, and they're sort of a set standing team. They're not a project team that builds something, they're a standing team whose responsibility is to build and maintain and operate and optimize that particular service. So that's my favorite pattern at the moment. You can find a lot more about that in the description and more talks about that later on. So that is one pattern I wanted to pick out. Another one I want to pick out where you can nicely see the relation between, um, between organization and architecture on a different side of things is the actual um, meta, I like to call it meta architecture of actually being able to put stuff into production, the deployment pipeline that you have, the factory that allows you to introduce new stuff. And what, you, what I'd like to talk about here is the idea of self-service. Now, in modern companies, you don't really have to argue about that because a modern company, one that's been founded last year, uses tons of software as a service offerings. It doesn't have a strong IT part, department. If you work in a huge bank or in a huge insurance company, then there will be a very, very strong IT operations department who guards the machines and the processes and all of the existing applications. And the whole idea of this cloud thing is still a little bit, they're still a little bit skeptical about it. But they've now recognized that it's okay, you have, probably have to do that to, to keep your job for the foreseeable future. So they adopt the cloud, but you know, cloud and, and uh, developer self-service that actually exploits the cloud means that a developer can actually use it themselves as opposed to opening a JIRA ticket somewhere so that somebody else will do something on the cloud for them. And that's a very common pattern that we see. So the exact opposite, empowering teams, empowering those autonomous cells or the members of those autonomous cells to actually do things within limits, within their budgets, is a key, uh, is a key thing here and a very important thing for many of the, uh, many of the discussions we have here. Now, the kinds of systems that we build um, follow um, something that I had to learn over the last, what's it now, close to three decades. When I started out a long time ago, 
I was convinced that um, this next project, the one I'm starting right now, would be the one where I would be building the perfect architecture. Right? I would not be doing, I would not be repeating any of the mistakes I did in the last project. This time I'll do it right. So, and you do that for a while, and after a while you notice there's sort of a recurring pattern. What you liked when you started that project, even if it's overall structure, is something that you deeply regret once the project is done. And there's a certain point in time where you switch from being really, really mad about that to you know, resignation, say, okay, it's not this one, it's gonna be the next one. So after a while you notice that that is not something that's sustainable until the end of your career, so you look for new ways to do things. And what I found is, is the only way that works is to accept that as a reality, to accept that even, on the, even the important decisions, even the ones on architectural levels, um, tend to be made wrong, or they tend to become wrong. Something that was a good decision today might be a really bad decision five years from now because the world has changed and whatever requirements existed today might not be there five years from now. As with all software development decisions, the same is true for major architectural decisions as well. So to address this on a different level means to say, uh, build your systems in a way so that they can evolve. Sort of, you know, embrace change. You folks should know that, right? So the idea here on an architectural level is we build the system so that we plan for a complete modernization five years from now. And the only way to do that is to split it into smaller parts and allow the smaller parts to evolve separately. So the idea and the image I picked here uh, from this human being is there because if I think of myself as a baby, then I'm still sort of the same person. I have the same identity. I am still Stefan, and I was back then, right? I'm still the same, per but I'm also, also I'm not. I mean, probably not a single one of my cells that I was composed of when I was five years old is still in my body today. I don't know much about biology, but I guess that's true, right? I've sort of renewed, I've sort of changed. I maintain my identity, but I also change. And that's the kind of systems that we should strive to build. We should build systems that allow us to question architectural decisions that we made and then change parts. We have a number of clients that are stuck with systems that they built 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago, like 12 million lines of Java code with lots of technical dependencies to stuff that nobody wants to, want, wants to touch anymore. And they're so annoyed by the next consultant coming in and telling them, why can't you replace that with a modern open source or cloud solution? Yes, I would love to, but I can't because it's 12 friggin' million lines of code. I can't just throw away 12 million lines of code and build them again. And I can't meaningfully halt development for one and a half years to move this to a new version of Java that would be required to use the new version of whatever library that would be required to use the new version of whatever cloud scenario I'm thinking of. It's simply not doable. So the only way to get out of that trap is to have smaller things. We say, well, we'll build something that that will, in, in, in a worst case scenario, if we throw this one part away, three people can build it again in three months. And if there's no part that's larger than that, then you can modernize slowly and deliberately. There are quite a few things that, that you need to consider when you do that, like you have to be able to have old parts work together with new parts. That's sort of the key thing here. And it, it sort of brings me to, a, to a, a key decision that people have to make in all kinds of scenarios, but in architectural scenarios specifically, so that's one that's, that's uh, keeping me busy quite a bit at the moment. And that's the idea of finding the right level of regulation. And I looked for a long time for a good analogy for that, and then I found this, and I absolutely love it. The idea here is, um, it's like a, like a weekly market. I assume you have those here as well, right? So it's a weekly market, I'm, so I'm, I'm German, right? In Germany, everything's very, very strictly regulated, so it doesn't have to be this regulated. But I would assume that even in a very irregulated environment, such a market has certain rules that the people who, who sell there have to follow. Like, for example, um, there has to be a way for people to, get, to, to walk between the individual uh, stalls, right? There has to be a way to, for, for people to flee if a fire occurs. Um, there has to be a way for the individual vendors to get power or maybe water. So there are some regulations that govern the, whole, the market as a whole. And there is a lot of freedom for each individual vendor to sell whatever they like at whatever price they like. Right? I mean, you can probably not tell one of them that they're not allowed to sell tomatoes today. If they want to sell it, they'll, they're going to do it, right? So there are rules, but the rules are not there to, 
to restrict people in their, in their core business. They are there to enable them to work together in this ecosystem. Right? That's, that's the key point here. So we should strive as architects, or in general as people with power in a, in, a, in a system environment, we should try to regulate the important things, but only the important things, the minimal amount of things. And we should regulate them um, very, very strictly. That's sort of the deal. I only regulate very, very few, but I regulate them very strictly. And then in, as a, as a, as a, in return, we'll give the individual teams or vendors, in my analogy, the, the maximum amount of freedom to do whatever they know how to do best. So let them make decisions as close to the actual work happening um, as possible and don't try to enforce some stupid rule just because you think that everybody has to do things the same way. Now, of, of course, there is a, there is a sort of a, um, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a there's a scale here, right? You can, you, can, you, can, you can decide to be very, very strict with a lot of things, and you can decide to basically have no rules at all, and so you get from the complete chaos environment that I mentioned before to the strictly regulated hierarchical environment. You don't want either of them. You want something that works for your organization and that gives people enough freedom to uh, innovate and evolve and still maintains enough interoperability and enough rules for them to collaborate. That's the key idea here. So what does that mean technically? I'm going to be very brief here because I don't want to bore you with that. But technically, we, we, when we talk about this in architectural terms, we talk about different perspectives on architecture, right? So let's say this is a decomposition of a large-scale system into different big parts, right? That would be sort of the domain architecture. That is something that is a little bit upfront because it essentially drives the boundaries for teams, right? This, you'll have to do this because Something like this may be created over the course of a few days if in a lot of discussion with stakeholders give you a way to set up parallel teams. I'm talking about bigger projects here, of course. Don't do any of that if you're a three-person team, of course. But if you're working with 20 or 25 or 100 or 200 people, then you have to have a way to separate work. And this is actually the business or the domain view of the whole thing, which is why we call it domain architecture. And then you have a different kind, different perspective on architecture, which is the actual interconnections between those systems. We like to call that the macro architecture. It doesn't really care as much about, the, about whether you split the whole system into five or seven or 26 parts, but it cares about how they talk to each other. How do you do data integration, logic integration, UI integration, if it's, if it's different systems? How do, you, how do you exchange data? What formats and protocols do you use so that one of these things can switch its Eternals to another uh, version or iteration if it wants to. Which brings me to the last part, which would be some sort of technical decision, like maybe the programming language you use or maybe the database technology you use. Those are all micro-architecture decisions that are sort of within the individual systems. You don't really care about those decisions, at least not from the overall interoperability perspective. You might care about those decisions because in a reasonable company, you would not want 200 different programming languages in actual use, but you'd maybe limit that to a reasonable number. But that's not really a macro architecture decision. It's more of a decision to uh, make sure that your people can switch and can move from one project to the other. So those are, that's sort of the, the technical implementation of the general idea of this evolutionary architecture thing that allows us to um, evolve and move on in the future. I've got one that I like to uh, that I like to maybe extend to any sort of community. I, I typically present it to architects, but I think it works in in many many regards. I think the 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 old idea of having um, a strict hierarchical structure with uh, people uh, making the rules from the top is in general one that doesn't work very good. Now, architects, as I mentioned at the beginning, like to um, to do interesting things. They like to, do, like to be involved with important decisions, and it's sort of tempting to say, well, just give me power, right? Give me a way to override decisions that anybody made somewhere. Give me the power to establish the rule book, the whitelist, the architectural guideline that everybody has to follow. That's, it's, it's tempting, and it's very good for one's ego until you notice that it doesn't work, right? So that, then it's really bad for your ego if everybody ignores your your perfect rule book. So if you, don't want, if you don't want that to happen, you have to um, address things differently. You have to um, actually do marketing even for technical ideas, do marketing for your process improvement ideas. 
And we found numerous things to work very well for that. So we sort of ran into that uh, by accident because we as a company, we're now like 150 people, we have like maybe 30 or 40 conference speakers who talk about stuff and that's very useful for us because we can talk about those things and people know that we're, we identify with that. But we also notice that our clients who do that have huge benefit of that as well because their ideas become discussed more often. They know how to defend ideas, they know how to, how to discuss their ideas and the good ideas will survive, which is a good thing because the bad ideas shouldn't, right? So if you put your ideas to the market, to the test, then that's a very good thing. Not everybody can do that, not everybody wants to do that, but there are smaller versions of that, like doing internal sessions. We have, great, have had great success with brown bag sessions with many clients where the idea is that you um, just invite people for a lunch where somebody's going to present something, right? So you need, just need a room. Um, it doesn't, it's typically even available because it's at lunch, right? At lunch, everybody's at lunch, not in there. And so people bring their, that's why it's called a brown bag session, they bring their brown paper bag with their food in it to that room and listen to somebody talk about why microservices are a great idea or a bad idea or why the move to the cloud is inevitable or why uh, Kanban is much better than Scrum. I have no idea. But it's, so you sort of create an audience that's there because it's interested and you sort of let the ideas um, and you disseminate the ideas and get people interested in them without having, that having to uh, order uh, somebody to do something. Um, again, that's a general recommendation. We found that works extremely well. Um, in, uh, in for, for, again, for many of our clients, one key problem, I don't know about the market here in Serbia, but for many of our clients, it's a problem to find good people, good developers, good architects, good project managers, product owners, good people are in high demand. And uh, doing this kind of, kind of thing is a, is a very nice way of getting the word out there that you're doing cool stuff at your company, which is one of the reasons why we like it a lot. Okay. So, let me summarize some of the stuff that I, that I wanted to say. Um, and let me try that by, I think I have to retire it soon, but I'm still, I'm still not giving up, I'm still giving it a try. I want my own law too. Um, and uh, my own law uh, is, of course, going to be um, Tilkov's law, and it's um, that you can observe the, uh, the, the quality of a system's architecture by, um, by the number of bottlenecks. You can look at the number of bottlenecks in a system, and the more bottlenecks it has, bottlenecks that limit its, its evolution, the worse the architecture is. Right? That's, I think, is especially and specifically if you, want, if you want to move fast, if you're in a company that wants to be agile and flexible and, and get new things into the market very quickly, then this is the key aspect and the key attribute that your architecture needs to expose. And if that doesn't work, I have another one that's a little more generic, so maybe that'll work, I don't know. That's the idea that all of the stuff that I talked about, all of the different kinds of architecture and organization and process, they all have to evolve together. You've seen numerous companies fail miserably because they addressed only one part of it. You really have to do the whole thing. You can't just assume because you have a cool architecture, everything else is going to be great, but the same is true for your process. If your architecture sucks, the best process is not going to fix it. It has to match, and the organization has to evolve with the whole thing. And that's all I have. Thanks a lot for listening to me today. Thank you very much for the amazing talk.